So uh, I am not Gary Zimmer. <laughs> if you're in for Gary Zimmer's talk, this is the wrong place. I'm Mark Shepard. Um, this is the uh, property where I've lived for the past 25 years. Yesterday's workshop was all about water management, uh, rainwater harvesting, and uh, stormwater management at the you know garden, farm, homestead, farm, ranch scale. All the patterns that you see are uh, it's patterned after distributing the water as it hits the land, spread it out from high in valleys out to the ridges and, and, and soak it in at certain discharge areas, store it in all kinds of ponds for watering livestock and irrigating um, different crops, etc. I'll talk a little bit about what it is, what it was. Is the idea 20 some odd years ago was to convert a uh, corn and beans farm uh, to a perennial polyculture mimicking a natural eco ecosystem type of uh, plant, natural plant community type, and doing it instead of like as a nonprofit or a research project, but doing it as a farming enterprise that actually pays its own way uh, and um, it does the ecosystem restoration, but uses the agriculture to pay the way to do the ecosystem restoration. And that has done that. This was taken at year 15. Um, the the uh, property is energy net positive. And one of the simplest things for energy net positive is every residential structure, every agricultural structure that we build will produce its own heat, will produce its own electricity, and will uh, capture its own rainwater, period. If we des don't design our buildings that way, it won't be that way. So every, every residential structure that we have, if your house doesn't heat itself, you know, energize itself, and, and harvest its own water for your use for whatever use it is. It's just designed wrong. So we're, it all starts with us. We have to transform our own lives and then transform all of the, all the rest of the planet along with us. <clears throat> but not, it's in southwest Wisconsin. Not a lot of people know that I grew up around these paths. I grew up in Lancaster, Massachusetts, 20 miles north of Wista. And um, some of my influence were, were some of these local boys. This guy right here, Luther Burbank. Um, he had some fascinating ideas when it came to uh, genetics. He actually is an individual human who is credited with developing more individually named plant varieties than any other person on the face of the planet. And he did it before we even knew what inheritance was. We didn't know about chromosomes. We, we never saw any, any kind of DNA or anything. Um, he did it through a process called mass selection, which is imitating nature. You guys know when, like, this oak trees, at least up in the Boston area, in Lancaster area, were crazy acorns this year, all over the place. So what happens is there's a million, zillion, and five acorns all over the place. Out of those zillions of acorns, <clears throat> only a few of them are going to make it to be a mature oak tree that produces acorns. The ones that make it had whatever genetics... Uh, allowed them to be fit for their, their current conditions. So they were adapted to the soil, to the rain, to the disturbance regime, to the animals, to the pollution, to whatever it is. And so that's all he did was mass selection breeding. Um, you guys familiar with French fries? The potato used for French fries is what? It's the Burbank russet potato. Where did he get that potato from? How do you get new varieties of potatoes? From seed. Well, you can't collect your seed. It's, you know, it doesn't breed, breed true to type. It's like, well, let's take apples, for example. You ever heard of this before? Don't save your apple seeds because it won't breed true to type. And besides, it'll take a 1,000 seeds in order to get one good variety. You ever heard something like that? That's at least what I was programmed into believing as a kid. Well, first of all, we have to examine that. That whole line right there is what I call bullshit. It's all a lie. And what we need to do as people who are on the ground transforming this planet, we have to cut through these lies and look at reality for a second here. Does anyone know of any example anywhere where anyone has taken an apple seed, put it in the ground, and it sprouted and turned into something other than an apple tree? It breeds true to type. It's not the same as its parent. Neither are we. None of us are genetically identical to our parents, and that's the whole point with sexual reproduction, the way this planet rolls, is we need these variations because someone here has the magic genes to do whatever it is that, that makes you particularly special. So then if it takes a 1,000 seeds to get one good apple variety, um, 
oh, therefore don't plant your seeds. That's a disempowering thought that has been put into our heads by these organizations and institutions that stand to make a lot of money from us and enslave us working for them. Because if we just take the same facts that it may take a thousand seeds to get one good variety, twist the conclusion around a bit and say, well, you know, how many seeds do you have to plant in order to get five good varieties? 5,000 seeds. How many, oh, shit, there's five seeds per apple tree. That's only 1,000 apples to get five brand new varieties of apples that are pest and disease resistant right here with no soil amendments, no add this goo, no add that spray, no weed control, pest control, disease control, nothing. All he needs is 5,000 apples to do that. So we need to be able to cut through the BS meter. And this guy right here, man, he, he did it in spades. 800 different plant varieties that he discovered that way just by rolling the genetic dice. These guys, this fellow right here was also born in Lancaster. Uh, then Lancaster split into four towns and became Lemister. John Chapman, you guys know who he is? Johnny Appleseed. So I've got this Luther Burbank plant all these things to find the magic plants that work. And then the Johnny Appleseed is go do this everywhere. So we are the Luther Burbanks and the Johnny Appleseeds um, of the future resource base of planet Earth. Everywhere we go, we should be leaving paradise in our footprints. That's just who we are and what we do. It's a new culture being born. These guys were right down the road, Henry David Thoreau. Um, you know, I took to the woods to live life deliberately to see if it was mean or sublime and all that kind of stuff. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, self-reliant. I don't necessarily like the word self-sufficient because nobody is an island. We're, we're social beings. We depend on one another because I have strengths and you have a lot more weaknesses. And so we can, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> So we, you know, we all work together and we have things. And what's interesting, if I have this outlook of scarcity, I've got to take, 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 take. And then you have that same outlook and we have to take, 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 take. Pretty soon we're all taking from one another. We've all been robbed. Well, if all of a sudden we just turn it around the other way, it's like, here, 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 here. We all start giving. Now when everybody starts giving, how do I deal with all this stuff that comes throwing at me? I've got all this incredible abundance. I have to give it away more, faster, faster, faster. It's just a different approach. And he was big on that. It was the birthplace of Mary Rowlandson, she, uh, 1653. The, that's the first book ever published um, in this continent, written book, uh, penned by a, a female. And she was captured by the Indians, and she wrote about her, her journeys through the wintertime. Uh, basically frozen, starved, three children you know, around her through the wintertime, and then she was ransomed in the springtime. And of course, right down the road, Concord. Concord. I did all the different marches and participated in all that kind of stuff. I was uh, like 12 years old during the whole bicentennial stuff. It was a big hoo-ha. It was also a crazy special time in that the whole civil rights movement was going on. There was this little kind of you know, war games going on down in Southeast Asia. When I was like a little kid, it was when they, they first started to televise war. And so it was like really raw. Nowadays, we don't know what's going on over in Afghanistan and Iraq and all that. But we'd see it every night on TV and see the bodies piled up. And as a 10-year-old kid, it's kind of like, whoa. And then the big game when I was little was guess what color the river is today? That's a Nashville River. It'd be red, green, blue, orange, pink. Uh, my favorite was this uh, creamsicle kind of blue, a really nice cobalt blue. It was really pretty. A friend of mine fell in, I think he was in second grade or something like that, was hospitalized for a week. When the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught on fire, um, I made the news. I'm like, Mom, why did, why did the Cuyahoga River make the news? Nash River catches on fire all the time. Isn't that what rivers do? It was like this ecological awakening. It's like, no, no, rivers aren't supposed to do that. And I lived, you know, I lived in Lancaster, Fitchburg, Lemister, the industrial bowels of, of Massachusetts. Not as bad as Lowell, okay? <laughs> but uh, you know, lived in uh, that apartment right there. That was that was where I lived at one point in time. All the little factory places. So when the tax code was changed to make it more favorable to move your business overseas, it was the gutting of the American industrial you know economy. Uh, and then of course the fuel and the gas embargo. When I was I think it was ten or eleven, or whatever. We we were rationed every other day. You could go get gas. And you could only get five gallons at a time. We were like at a half a mile gas line. It was in Lemister at the time. It was the closest gas station. <clears throat> and we're in line. Baby brother's in his car seat, and he's throwing Cheerios all over the place and screaming and hollering. And me and my Irish twin, he's like you know, eight and a half months younger than me, um, 
All of a sudden, the car runs out of gas. We've got to go push. How many of you are the oldest sibling in the family? You will all vouch for me and attest to the fact that the next one down never pulled their own weight. Okay? <laughs> so here's this 10-year-old pushing a car in a quarter of a mile gas line, 10 years old. I had a lot of time to think about where this planet is going and what our culture is all about. That my dad had to, to get up and go to work to get the money, to get the food, to get the energy, to get up, to go to work, to get the food, to get the energy, to get up, to go to work. We had the biggest garden around. He was somewhat notorious in the hippie crowd because he knew how to make compost. And he was, you know, you know, mildly famous at the time. This was back at, if you said organic, you could lose your job for being a communist. So uh, it, was a, it was a radically different time. And... Um, so even though we were, had the biggest garden around, we weren't feeding ourselves. We still went to the store to buy our staple food crops. How do we feed ourselves, and how did people feed it themselves once upon a time? Started to read around. I ran into this book here, Tree Crops, A Permanent Agriculture by J. Russell Smith. My dad knew I was into trees. I like trees. Written in 1926. At the time, about 50% of all annual crops were fed the livestock to raise livestock. Uh, and he was going around on behalf of the USDA trying to document and figure out how to prevent soil erosion. It was before the Soil Conservation Service got started and all that. Um, and he wrote about the fact, why don't we on hillier ground and, and so on grow permanent pasture and then grow trees that have seeds and fruits and berries and all that kind of stuff, let the animals graze and eat the seeds and fruits and berries, and then we'll grow the, the, the staple grains down on the flatland where we don't have as much erosion. It's more fertile anyways. Um, and he, he said that the, and you think about our annual crops, it's not a permanent agriculture. It's temporary. You plant your seeds. They grow for a couple, three months. You can put them in your pocket or a bag over your shoulder, and you can run to the next place where you can plant your seeds. It's a temporary nomadic type of agriculture. So I saw this thing, permanent agriculture, really stuck in my brain. And then not too long afterwards, uh, a couple of small little books came out, Permaculture 1, Permaculture 2 by this Australian guy, really, really flipped me out, turned me on, because it was talking about redesigning the habitat around us to be ecologically sound and economically profitable at the same time. And that's the first edition hardcover of the Permaculture Designer's Manual. How many of you guys are familiar with permaculture? <laughs> It's a contraction of the words permanent agriculture, according to the definition uh, put out by the guy who actually invented the word. Everything else that it's turned into, oh, permanent culture, and this and that, that's, that's great. He talked about redesigning human habitats uh, for food, fuels, medicines, fibers, and have a different kind of economy where we actually took care of one another and tried to fleece, instead of trying to fleece one another. Um, <clears throat> anything other than that, I don't buy into this whole thing that 16 bricks with a little bit of grass in it, rocket stove, that's not permaculture. That's a doodad. A mud oven is not, a, not permaculture. It's a doodad. These are all techniques or tools that you can use within a systematic redesign of our human habitat and our, and our interrelationships. Now, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today that's going to require you guys. I already talked about the apples, seeds, Luther Burbanks, and the breeding. There's a lot of stuff that we've been taught and we've been told uh, that isn't true. And we, we, we don't even question certain things because it's just the way things are, right? Well, we need to because a lot of that is not helpful. What if every sixth grade kid saved their apple seeds, put it in like their lunch cup, and grew that little apple seed into a little tree and planted it in their backyard? We would now have how many millions of little apple seedlings all across the USA, how many varieties of new varieties of fruit could we get that survive with no fertilizer, herbicide, pesticide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Because you put them out in the backyard, and if it can survive your little brother who's pissed at you and runs it over with a lawnmower, if it can survive the goats that break out of their pen and chew it down to the ground, if it can survive you know, your cousin Chad's car who goes out and does donuts in your backyard when he was 19 years old and got ripped, um, if it can survive all that and puts out a real beautiful fruit um, that's pest and disease free, we've got a, a miracle new variety out there. By the way, the first apple seed that I ever put in the ground to grow into a tree is fantastic. It's an incredibly delicious variety. I'll be showing a picture of it later on. It's, it's uh, a codling moth really likes it, but the other diseases don't seem to bother it. It's almost pest and disease free. Otherwise, it wouldn't have survived that long. 
So we have to know the difference between an observation and a concept. You know, an observation is something we can see, hear, taste, touch, smell, measure with instruments, derive through testing, but a concept is purely an idea that we've invented to simplify reality. And when we see the world through our concepts instead of what's actually observable, it's not the truth. And I'll bring up a, one little simple illustration of that, invasive species. We've all heard that term? Name one creature on the face of the planet that has an intellectual concept called invasion. That's human beings. Well, how do we respond to an invasion? You fight, 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 fight. Because we've viewed this organism through the lens of invasion, we don't actually see what it is. Why is it there? How did it get there? How did it propagate? What, what soil types does it like? What kind of water regime? Does it like the sun? Does it like the shade? What kind of pests or diseases like it now or could like it, liked it in its homeland? We fail to learn about reality because it's invasive species, fight! And we have yet to win that game. We've yet to win that game. When we see the world through our concepts, we're not seeing reality. So what I'm going to do just here is a simple exercise. Not to say that you're wrong or messed up or whatever. It's just that this is so deeply enculturated in us that we don't even realize what's happening. I'm going to show you a picture of a bunch of bananas. Okay? And what I'm going to ask you right now is what color is this bunch of bananas? It's, the variety is a Cavendish. It's the kind of banana that we see on the, on the Cumbies every single time you walk in. And I like being able to say Cumbies because you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's a convenience store. So I packed my cat in the lot next to a Cumbies and I went into a Packy. What was I doing? What was I doing? They know. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a bunch of Cavendish bananas. What color are they? Okay. And, you know, like I said, it's not right or wrong. This is just revealing something about our culture and how we've been enculturated. If you uh, thought or said yellow, you're wrong. That is tones of black and white. It's grayish. That's yellow. And it was just something simple, but it, it's, it's even more deep and, and, and complex than that. So we were taught things about agriculture that may be factually true, but they're put in such a way that we conceptualize things in a, in a real damaging, harmful way. What is this idea about slash and burn agriculture? Oh, the cute little people, once upon a time, they made these little holes in the forest, and they grew their little gardens, and they burned it, and then they moved a few years later. That's a cute little story. It's really neat, wonderful. But it's not true. It, there, are, there, are, there are entire uh, groups of people that identify themselves. I work with one group in, in Africa, the Sukumu. It's not that... Uh, that this is what we like to do, or how we derive our economy. This is who we are. We are the Sukuma. We cut trees. Uh, and, it, and it's not just happening in little pockets. It's happening on a massive scale. Um, a lot of it in Africa, for example, is for the charcoal trade. You cut the trees down. You burn, you know, make it into charcoal, burying it in, in dirt and all that, and you sell the, the, the charcoal in the city for cash. You use the cash to go buy alcohol, um, and then you have a great time for a few years till the trees are gone, and then you just go forward. Well, so then the, um, the gardener-type folks come in, and they try to eke a living in, in, the, in the soils as it's now depleting and washing all away. The they end up starving, and then the grazers come in, and they graze it down to the bare bones of the, of the planet, and then they move on, and big ag comes in. It's part of what they're doing. This is from the UNI um, sugar company in, um, that was in Uganda right there. You see how the sky is kind of hazy? How long ago was this a high canopy closed monsoon forest with large primates, specifically chimpanzees, before this picture was taken? Four years. Four years this had chimpanzees in it and everything. So the same thing is happening in the U.S. Oh, well, you know, we need agriculture. You've got to plow the ground. Or, well, you've got to use herbicide. Or you've got to use complete mulch. Or you've got to do whatever in order to grow crops. This is what farming is. We're growing crops. You've got to get rid of the ecosystem. And then we grow our whatever it is. And then we wonder why it's deficient in all kinds of nutrients. Because we're washing it away in the rain. And we're, we're told, oh, this is a disaster. This is a disaster. And the crop insurance has to pay for it. You know, oh, poor guy. What happens... See, this, there's a river going by here. What happens, what's that flat part on either side of the river channel called? 
floodplain. The answer is right in there. What happens to floodplains every once in a while? They flood. This is not a fucking disaster. This is normal. So what on earth are we doing exposing the soil in floodplains? This is just what we call stupid. But agriculture, we need agriculture. It's perfectly harmless activity. And this is the United States of America. We're scientific. Everything's fine. It's wonderful. You know, we're not like washing our topsoil out to sea fast as can be. And when our soils have enough moisture to actually hold crops through the whole year, it's too wet to plant in March. So instead of fixing, finding a different crop to plant in March, let's drain the water off. Let's drain it all away so all the pesticides, fertilizers, herbicides go down the, the I was going to say the National River, but that's, it does that too. Down the Mississippi River, it makes a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. The problems that we have and we're facing have been caused by human beings. We, we just have. You know, I mean, who caused all this? We did. We did. We're not interactive. For what? A handful of seeds. A handful of hard seeds. This picture right here... Um, I put it in there. There was a historical plaque. I'm driving through East Central Ohio. It's like, oh my gosh, what's this, what's this history here? This is really cool. And I stopped. This was a waypoint during the Jefferson administration. I think you don't, not quite old enough to remember the Jefferson administration. But um, they had, it was called the, it was after the Louisiana Purchase, it was the Northwest blah, blah, what they called it when they, Whatever it was, uh, and what they did is they they had sent survey teams out every six miles apart, and there'd be a gang of us um, with our supplies, and we would go six miles, put a pin in the ground, and then describe what was around us, and go another six miles in a straight line. So they did a grid survey of the whole. It was the Western Reserve. It was the Western Reserve, <clears throat> and this particular spot uh, was where they stopped and did an observation. At that particular spot, there were approximately six oak trees per acre, big, gigantic, huge oak trees, with mountain lions hanging out in the oak trees. And they had like turkeys and deer dripping off the branches because they caught it and just hanging up in the branches. It was uh, filled with bison. There were both black bear and grizzly bear hanging out, herds of white-tailed deer, not just like a white-tailed deer here and there trying to hide from the, from the people, but like herds of white-tailed deer, herds of elk. Um, the ground birds like the flocks of ground birds all over the place. It was like the African savanna. It was just so incredibly rich. But the thing that they remarked most was that um, the, the grass was over the heads of their horses when they got through there. So, of course, this is, these are some of the myths or the stories that got people to come down the Ohio River. We get to this beautiful, incredibly rich land. Uh, and so we cut it all down. We plow it all up. It's too wet to plant in the spring, so we make a ditch to drain the, all the water away. And so that's what we get left. This, this is agriculture. But we have to do this. This is progress. You know, this is westward hoe and all that kind of stuff. So somehow we've been told that this is good and this is right. This is what we're supposed to do. And it's wonderful and it's historic and it's progress. And somehow we've been told that, and this, this is, there's a lot of stuff in this picture right here. We're told that if, if we have a more plant-based diet, we will have a smaller ecological footprint than if we have an animal-based diet. It's like, well, maybe so. So if we were to go out here and have a plant-based diet, or if we go here and have a plant-based diet based on, on corn and beans, for example, just as two examples, which one would have a smaller ecological footprint? So one of my challenges to the, to the people who don't eat animal products, uh, first of all, if you eat animal products, don't eat animal products that were raised here because that's where this is going. Now it's up to 80%, some odd 80% of all our corn and beans goes right into feeding livestock. If you eat animals that come from this system here, start eating animals that come from a system here that's more perennial. If you don't eat animals, stop eating this shit because you're not even designed to eat it. We're missing several critical uh, body organs that digest these things. One is a crop and the other is a gizzard. Start eating stuff that grows out here. There's plenty of non-animals to eat out here. And what's remarkable, in a system like this, if you're eating the non-animals, there's more food for animals out there, and there's more animals there. The air's healthier, the water's healthier, it's cleaner, there's more nutrients because these are not adapted and evolved to live in this soil, so they have extreme deficiencies. So we have to add the compost, add the, you know, the the you know, mushroom goo, and we have to add all these different things to bring the nutrient density up, or let's go eat this ecosystem of the plants that are adapted and evolved to live in a particular place that provide us all the nutrients that we need. 
I'm not saying let's go out and become hunter-gatherers all over again. We need to redesign our habitat to be a, a natural ecosystem, perennial ecosystem, a three-dimensional polyculture, and it will be, it is, far more nutritious and provides more calories than that does. Um, yeah, stop this, please. Uh, another thing, back to our observations and our concepts. In one sense, I don't really care who wins the argument of whether, oh, climate change is real, it's a hoax, witch hunt, you know, F that, okay? We have to survive reality as it is. Uh, and as, as how many of you guys are farmer types or gardener farmers? So <laughs> we have to take what comes. There's really no way that we can change the weather personally, individually, whatever. We have to deal with it. And where I get a lot of information on weather stuff, I forgot what E-Q-E-C-A-T stands for, but what it is, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of like the oversight board uh, uh, elected from the industry for uh, insurance companies. Now, insurance companies are bookies. They're placing bets every day that the money that you pay me, I'll be able to invest and make more money off of, and then the losses and the claims that you guys come up with, I'll take the risk, and I'll pay you off and pay you off, pay you off. Well, these bookies collect real data, and they adjust the odds. Uh, and they're, they're finding out that, guess what? Since 1950, tornadoes touchdowns have tripled since 1950. Storm intensity actually is going up. Uh, more frequent high-intensity uh, storms. Last April, you guys remember the bomb cyclone? That was the largest storm that was ever observed on planet Earth. The spiral arms of this cyclone storm went from Greenland all the way out to Hawaii. It was almost like a third of the planet. One storm! So they're getting bigger. And what's interesting is our annual plants are responding to temperature rise, and they're responding to increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by decreasing their yields and by decreasing their nutritional value. So... Uh, back to the storms, though. It's really interesting that the circumstances happened how they did. There was a huge wake-up call in Agriculture America this year because of all the water, all the rain, that was exacerbated by the fact that we've got all this tile drainage on most of the ag land that makes it all run away. The rain comes down. It washes away. The floods are bigger. So uh, approximately... Um, how many million acres is this? It was about 25% of the uh, U.S. corn, wheat, and soybean crop. 25% of that crop never was planted. How do you, get, how do you survive as a culture when you have 25% uh, unplanted crops? Well, then, of course, the uh, insurance that was paid out to pay all these farmers for the crop losses, see where all the insurance payments was. Agricultural disaster. Let's look at this for a second. This is normal. This is normal. We get floods. We get rain. We get tornadoes. We get storms. Let's design an ecosystem that produces our food, fuels, medicines, and fibers, and more nutrition per acre, hectare, however you want to measure it, and is resilient in the face of disaster because these plant community types have evolved here over 6,000 years or hundreds of millions of years. You pick the reference material that you're using to base that on. But what was convenient about this, this crop loss, I don't go to the crop losses yet, but at 25%, not even planted, it was just so convenient, and I almost wonder if they saw the writing on the wall and said, well, let's, let's put tariffs on the Chinese so they stop buying our crops. Well, so if the, and we can, we can kind of hoodwink people into believing that it was the tariffs that caused it, but the real reason why we couldn't sell the Chinese our crops is because we didn't have them. We had a 25% crop loss in the USA across the board. How convenient that we didn't see it. Well, what happens if we are dependent on that for food and now we have a 25% crop loss? Which 25% of you wants to go hungry for the next year? 30% of the human race lives in slums. UN, all UN data here. This is now 61, not 59. I only put this together like two months ago. 61 funded, UN funded refugee camps around the world. A million and a half people. So 30% of 7 billion is how many billion people? Two and a half billion? Almost 3 billion people? Uh, 70 million people are refugees from war where they live is, is a war zone and they, they're running to escape. 
And uh, 119 out of 178 nations of the world, two-thirds of the nations of the world are at risk of imminent collapse, not like eventually. How about any second now? A hiccup could happen in their system somehow, and boom, it collapses. We're in the zombie apocalypse, folks. We are in the middle of it right now. I like the, the metaphor, because we can talk about really scary shit and talk about zombies, and it's all right. It's, 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 it diffuses it a little bit. But we are, we are in some really fascinating times, and we need to do something about it. <laughs> and then 80% of human beings live in places like this. Sorry, I am not interested in living on a planet like this and like, like that. But we got no choice. We are living in the zombie apocalypse now. And there's a guy from New York State, James Howard Kunstler. He's got one of the weirdest last names to pronounce, if you've ever tried pronouncing it. Um, if you take a lobster and you put it in cold water and you turn up the heat, eventually the water gets hot enough, the lobster will die and it'll boil. But the lobster never reacts, never you know, flips out or whatever. But those of you who've you know, boiled lobsters, you get the water real hot, you put it in, they scream like hell, and they start flipping and flapping and splashing all over the place. We're in the long emergency in that there's this resource decline going on around worldwide. The economy's falling apart worldwide. The debt's climbing worldwide. There's all these issues going on, and we really don't see it because it's not that bad compared to yesterday. And we're still eating. It's not that bad. And prices and this and that and the other thing. How do we feed ourselves um, as this system continues to collapse? You guys are already interested in food and nutrition. You're growing food. You're coming to this conference, which means you're interested in more nutritious food. So like if we eat carrots, you can eat 75 of these nasty carrots um, to get the same amount of nutrients as one carrot over here. I show a slide that Dan put together earlier. How do we feed ourselves real food now? No joke, no more time. There's no more time to like think about this, study about this. And, and oh, somebody will come up with an answer. No, we're the ones. We are the ones because we have to survive this zombie apocalypse. How do we nourish ourselves without destroying what's left? These right here are pictures of, of uh, the great state of, no, great, excuse me, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Well, Commonwealth, isn't that fascinating? What that means, everybody in Massachusetts shares all of the good? <laughs> so that's what, that's what Massachusetts looks like. There is more nutrition per acre uh, in a system like that than there is in any garden or farm that you guys can ever plant. And if you want to go ahead and compare this, we'll go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, plot of land to plot of land. There is more nutrition there than in your garden. And there, how much work went into maintaining this? Who plowed the ground, hauled the mulch, where'd they get the mulch from, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Who pulled the weeds? Um, this is the ecological model for this place right here. How do we heal this crap? How do we turn this or that? into something more like this. Or, right here in this context, you're not going to be the Oak Savannah of Wisconsin. Don't try. You know, this is Massachusetts. It's going to look like this. You don't have to wear the funny hats, though. That's, that's, that's past. We can do it while providing a complete human nutrition. I don't know if the guy is here who is asking about, oh, but harvest, it'd be impossible to harvest. How can you harvest this stuff? It's like, well, time out. These are apples. I want you to pick apples. These are grapes. Don't pick those. So pick the apples. It's not these are hazelnuts. This is, this is a polyculture on my farm in southwest Wisconsin based on the oak savanna plant community type. Instead of planting wild varieties into a purist restoration, I'm planting you know, known cultivars or selecting and breeding for my own cultivars of apples. How many of you guys have four different apple varieties to your name that you've bred and developed that are pest and disease resistant with no fertilizer, fungicide, herbicide inputs, no pruning, grafting, or nothing. How many of you guys have that going on? Why not? Why aren't you planting your seeds? Plant your seeds and grow in a system like this. How much pruning did I do when there's branches all over the place? How much work really went into this? I didn't spray a thing. Wrote about it in a book. Buy it. Take a picture of that right there. You'll go right to the sales page. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll give you time on this one. All right, so I'm gonna, how we're going to do this, um, it's based on the fact that there is uh, an observable phenomena that every one of you has observed and can observe over and over again. 
there is an invisible power, an invisible, it's the, <laughs> it's the force. One of the forces. There's an invisible, unconquerable force on this planet that we cannot beat. Um, and it relates to what you guys are doing. How many of you guys have a garden or a farm? Have you ever had weeds in the garden? Have you ever pulled the weeds? Have you ever won? All right, so what's going on is this planet, no matter where you are, whether it's hot or cold or dry or wet, no soil or soil, this planet wants to clothe itself in green. And it does it despite the best things that we can do. Even, even the picture of the tractor with the dust and all that, why is he tilling the ground? Because all these weeds are coming back. I swear soil must be like 99% weed seed because you keep pulling it year after year, even before it sets seed, and you still have all this weed seed. Natural succession, the ability of the earth to clothe itself in green, has yet to be defeated. It always wins. So I'm going to tell a story here that reveals some of the power of this natural succession of the plant communities on the planet. And because of the mixed crowds that I talk to, sometimes I say, well, okay, this is just a story. It's a mythological story. That doesn't mean it's not true, because sometimes a myth has truths in it. And, and truth is uh, some kind of moral implications to it. Well, it also might be factual. So I can tell a myth that's both true and factual, or I can tell a myth that's just representative of something using metaphor and allegory. So just ride with this. This is a, just a mythological story. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, yeah, we did the garden thing already, there was this big rock that falls out from the sky. All of the people were these like lizard dinosaur kind of things going around, and the big rock falls out of the sky. Kaboom! It splashes on Yucatan Peninsula, makes these big waves that flood all over the planet and push fish up on the shore. And then an 8,000 degree wall of heat goes around and incinerates the planet within 24 hours. 60, something like 60%, 50 to 60% of all life on planet Earth perished. Gone. That was a disaster absolute disaster. The soils were instantly alkalized from all the ash washing off. The, everything, everything changed. But look what came out of it. Look what came out of it. In a few brief years, it kind of like puts itself back together again, recolonizes everything. And some of the soils south of Chicago are 200 feet deep of topsoil. It's like, wait a minute. 200 feet deep of topsoil, how does that happen? It happened with no earthworms. What? No earthworms? It happened with no honeybees. Uh, and it happened with no fossil fuel inputs, this, that, and the other thing. So the amazing fertility that, that we got to tap into when we do annual agriculture and destroy the ecosystem to plant our stupid hard little seeds that we can't even digest, um, those soils were created by the life that lives there. And it, they made the soil. They created the soil. Um, I was hoping that the Croatian person was here because this is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, you got to go there. It's Plitvitska Jezera in Croatia. Go there. Amazing place. Um, well, okay, so if you don't believe a mythological story, this is something that happened in my lifetime. I was a junior in high school. My cousins lived in Spokane, and so they got to experience this whole thing a lot more close hand. There was this mountain, all this diversity of life going on. All of a sudden, kablooey, period of a couple of weeks, it just kind of <laughs> blows its top. And about a third of that mountain just turned into like gravel and was spit up into the air and it covered the you know, rest of the planet, made beautiful sunsets for a couple of years. But look at the slopes, lower slopes of the hill. It was a wasteland. But what happened is there were some refugia, or refugia, I don't know how you want to pronounce that. Somehow, for some reason, this stuff didn't get incinerated or buried too deep. And the process continued. This natural succession, this change of ecosystems over time continued. So this is a degraded resource base. The natural communities aggraded that resource base, took something that's basically you know, crushed rock, not a lot of organic matter, not a lot of biological activity, and then it lights up. And within a few years, three or four years, it was a grassland. And then the flowers start to kick in, the shrubs start to kick in. Um, this, I think, was four years after. This was 15 years after. It's, it's coming on. The system's coming back. It's 35 years after. That same power, the same force that does that, all by itself, think about how affordable that is. 
if you don't have to put any money or any labor into this, you set it up and it does it all by itself. All we got to do is go out there and harvest the yields that are coming off of it. And in a natural system, it's going to have a huge diversity of things, not all of which that we can harvest, eat, sell, or convert into animals through feed. Um, so if we set up a system that's heavily weighted on the food, fuels, medicines, and fibers plants that is this particular plant community type, and then we turn it loose, we have zero inputs. And what's your return on investment if you have zero inputs into something and you get, say, $10 cash at the end of the year? You did no work all summer long. Here's, here's a great example. Take your garlic seed out in the backyard this fall and just throw it out there and walk away. Next fall, or next July, go out there, and I'm willing to bet you a nickel you'll find a garlic or two. So when you find that garlic or two, pick it up, sell it to somebody, and make a dollar. The return on investment for that type of garlic is incalculable because you're trying to divide by zero because your costs were zero. It's infinitely incalculable. We're working with imaginary numbers here. So to plant a system like this with all these different food plants and you just go out and harvest it, your rate, on, rate of return is insane. And so what do you do while that garlic is just doing its thing? And 99% of them are dying. It's your, you're hanging out at the beach, you know, you're visiting with family, you're making music, you're doing something useful and productive, you're helping others to you know, get lazy just like you. So this process of natural uh, succession can start with the bare planet. And it goes through a phase where it's now colonized by lichens and mosses, then it goes through a grassland phase, then a lot more flowers, and a shrubland phase, and sun-loving trees, and shade-tolerant trees. This process happens everywhere on the planet, different rates of speed based on limits like water availability, temperatures, and of course the species are all different, different species here than in Arizona. Uh, then there's some kind of disturbance comes along that's natural and normal. California is a fire ecosystem. It's been burning episodically for as long as we have records in the fossil record for. And you can go to like some of these older trees and you look at the burn scars. So what happens is a burn goes by. It's green and lush. All kinds of animals go through. They graze it like crazy. So for a few years, there's no real big catastrophic fires. Well, pretty soon the brush starts to grow up, and then the animals kind of go somewhere else because that's where the grass is better. And then now you have all this, this brush underneath, and then it burns like mad, and it goes back to the grassland phase. So instead of adapting to the ecosystem as it is, human beings have gone in with a, a concept and say, we can build flammable wooden houses out here, and things won't burn because we do fire suppression. Yeah, keep singing yourself to sleep at night when the zombies are coming out of the cemetery. Um, wind, grazing, fire, flood, volcano, earthquake, these are natural disturbances. They're natural normal. All the plants and plant communities on this planet are accustomed to rising temperatures. If you go outside and you look at, at the hills that are around this place, these plants, at least in the oak family, have been around in the fossil record for 95 million years. There's been over 30 global warming spikes and global cooling spikes since when the oaks showed up. They can roll with it. They got it made. The pines are even older, something like 180, 200 million years old. They've been through this before. It's no big deal. So what? Oh, but the CO2 levels are like nothing that they ever have been since when? When the pines and the oaks first got started and they're totally accustomed to it. Thank you very much. And who did the fertilizer back then? Who did the weed control back then? Nobody. They're used to this. So why are we growing crops in this phase that require disturbance over and over again? Why are we playing with annual plants that have to have bare soil? We have to either plow the ground, keep it fully mulched, use herbicides, something to get rid of what's there that wants to live, and then we have to try to keep alive our stuff that wants to die. And don't you think it's a little backwards? Why are we trying to keep shit alive that wants to die? And why are you trying to kill stuff that wants to live? How about using the stuff that wants to live and figure out how to use it more efficiently, more effectively? How about now breeding for improved varieties? All that kind of stuff. It's a different culture altogether. I still keep asking somebody to provide me with a um, five-acre rock in the middle of Lake Superior or Spednik Lake up in northeastern Maine, and I'll show you how to farm that at a profit um, and make a go out of it. Because right here, these are all the answers. are right there. Your lichens, algae, and a, and a um, fungus combined, they dissolve the rock. 
they photosynthesize, they bring carbon out of the atmosphere, it decays, enough soil to start growing mosses. And notice how they're forming in the, in the water, collecting little cracks and nooks and crannies. Some of the mosses die enough for grasses to get established. If you go out in the middle here and you pull up a tuft of that grass, what's attached to the roots of grass when you pull it up? Soil. Where did the soil come from? The plant community made it. It made it out of the solid rock and the atmosphere and the rain. So if you're farming or gardening in such a way that you have to add something to the system to improve the soil, you're farming the wrong way. You're fighting against nature. You will lose. Annual crops agriculture has a 10,000 year plus track record of constant continual failure. That's why these societies go into collapse and they have to go take over the next people and destroy their place and take over the next people and enslave the other people over and over and over again. Um, this, however, was taken right up the road. This is a, this is a plant community. Uh, this is in um, doom, 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 Purgatory Chasm in Sutton. Where the hell is the soil? Where is the soil that this pine tree is growing in? Where is it getting its, its soil nutrition from? It's making the soil. This plant community is creating the soil. It's making it more diverse, more rich, and there is more nutrition in these plants right here than in any of your gardens, period. Natural plant communities, it's assemblage of interacting plants, blah, 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 that work together to do this. Um, and they repeat. They repeat across this landscape. What's really funny is there's some place I go to, I'm talking about these perennial polycultures. I'm only using a handful of species, you know, say five above ground species and five animal species. And they're like, well, don't you think there's like too much of a risk for catastrophic failure? That's too much of a monocrop. It's like, well, why does nature repeat itself over and over and over and over and over again? You go to the oak plant community and the pine plant community, and you're talking about half of North America? And how come nature gets away with it? Well, because there's enough diversity in the system and it's adapted to all the different changes going on. How do I find out what plant community types are around me? Go online, mass.gov, and search for terrestrial palestrine esterine community types. <clears throat> and then you go, you find your plant community types, like, oh, I think, let's see, what kind of tree is that? Oh, that's an oak tree. I think I've got, you know, open, is it open oak forest woodland with like some grass under it? Is it a coastal forest? Is it an oak hickory? You know what? So you figure out where it is, what plant community type that you are. Then you go further on that, and you look at the species list. And then you pick out all the edible ones, doop, 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 and you plant them together. If you've got a 20-foot circle in your backyard, plant them all in a 20-foot circle. Yes? I'm assuming other states have a pretty good list. Correct. Almost every state that I've been to has a pretty good list. Massachusetts, I would go natural plant community type blank. I don't want to get coffee on my shirt. First time I wore this shirt. It's the last time it's going to be clean. Probably because Dan Kittredge will mud wrestle me out in the parking lot, but that's, <laughs> that's a story from yesterday. So then you go into that and like red, red oak, sugar maple transition forest, blah, blah, blah. And you go in there and you, and you find out what the edibles are. You throw them in the same spot, even if it's a 20-foot circle in your backyard. And then you know what you do? You walk away. You ignore it. And you know, maybe you want to go out there because you're a master gardener and you don't get enough fiber in your diet, and so you've got to snip and prune and maybe mulch and stuff. That's fine. Um, and it'll grow. Yeah, but what about the ones that are going to grow tall and the ones that are going to grow small? It's like, so what? They've got this figured out. They know how to do it. The ones that will grow tall will grow tall, and the ones that are short will stay short. It's fascinating. We don't have to plan this or anything. It's already been figured out for us. I'm going to pick... Uh, an overlap of two different plant community types because here's what you will never be able to do uh, without an extreme amount of work. I'm going to take the scrub oak shrubland and your pine barrens ecosystems, both of which are natural native to Massachusetts, you know, all of, all of New England states. These are some of the shittiest places to try to grow anything in Massachusetts, all right? So if you're going to try to grow any kind of garden there, you're going to have a hard time doing it. This, this is this is Massachusetts. This is what it looks like. Most of us don't recognize this as a 100% edible food forest. This is the food forest of what Massachusetts is on the worst soils that you could ask for, with the worst weather you could ask for. <clears throat> it's 
arranged naturally based on the disturbance type, you know, the wind and the rain and all that kind of whatever. It's not designed and planned and planted intentionally as a farm or a garden, so the efficiencies are a lot lower. We're not going to have as much calories come out of it, as much, you know, fruits and nuts and berries that come out of it. It's that wild crafting thing. We've got to go out and gather things that are not abundant. Well, if we take all these, we order it a little bit, manage the water on the site, and then plant it as if it's our farm, because it is our farm now. Will this stuff grow here on the worst soils in Massachusetts? Yeah, it will. <laughs> this stuff grows here. This is all, sorry for you Connecticut's and Rhode Island's and Maine's. It's, it's all, <laughs> this is all here. This is right here out the backyard. So um, this graphic, of course, doesn't include um, much of Massachusetts here. This is a Rosetta Stone. Take a picture of this. This is your oak plant community type. I've arranged them in order of height from tallest to shortest. Your canopy trees in the, in the oak plant community are the phagaceae, oaks, chestnut, and beech. Beech is a late successional. It likes coming in in the shade afterwards. It has its own plant community type once it develops, its, it colonizes a site. The plants that are there for the longest period of time color the site. They uh, they chemically change it with their roots, with their leaves, etc. So an oak site will only allow the species to live there that are tolerant of what oak does to a site. Beech colors the site. Uh, all these other trees color the site, and so you can only live there. Like black walnut's a great example. People think that it kills everything. It doesn't. It only kills things that's not part of its gang. Understory of apples. This was all here before, before Europeans got here. Hazelnuts. It's a shrub. The prunuses, plums, cherries, peach, nectarines, almonds, apricots, raspberries, blackberries, grapes, currants, gooseberries, fungi, forage, and animals. Show me the annual plants in that system. Once you plant this system, how long can it be here and subsist right here in the New England states? Oh, I don't know. Give it 95 million years or so, right? Yeah, 95 million years. All right. Is that sustainable? From my opinion, if you have to plant your... your crops again next year, that's not sustainable. That is not sustainable. This right here has been through it all. It's been through it all. Or you can go plant this. Cool. And now, now you need your compost. You need your worm castings. You need your this. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have that, because with all these other doodads and additives that you can add to your system, is you can ramp up the productivity of your system even faster. Set up, set up this system and now juice it with your compost teas and your worm castings and your, and your minerals to, to plug in any deficiencies that you might have in your soil. And, um, yeah, we'll get into the nutrients later. Then the other one is the, is the pines. These live with pine. So pine, pine nuts, beech, the cherries, plums, service berries, hazelnuts, blueberries, raspberries, lingonberries, uh, cranberries, grapes, wintergreen, fungi, forage, livestock. It's been here for over, you know, way longer than the oak families. And they mix. They mix together with one another. Do you guys know of any place in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, or Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, where you have not seen a pine? Some places, like with the oak, uh, further up north here, it gets pretty sparse. These are natural, native, adapted. Uh, they belong here. They belong here. Or we can cut it all down and then grow corn and wonder why we're getting shitty yields. So let's go to our corn. Corn was a, a staple food in, a, in, in the, you know, the North American cultures for a long period of time. But even that is, is ridiculous. This is just a nutritional analysis. This is out of my book, uh, Restoration Agriculture. These are all the things, if you eat corn, that are deficient. You have to come up with these somewhere, somehow in your diet because of all the deficiencies. I can go side by side with wheat and beans and lake. I can do the whole American diet side by side and the deficiencies are insane. Why do you think there's a vitamin industry? Because the food that we're eating is garbage. This is not, now go ahead and put all the doodads you want on the soil. <laughs> Your corn will not produce the folic acid. It is just not in it. I don't care what you do to the soil system to make hypernutrient density. It won't have folate. It just doesn't have it. Panathenic acid is deadly deficiency. Absolute deadly deficiency. Niacin, not panathenic acid, excuse me. Niacin, it causes, causes pellagra. All, all, although that is in corn, it's not available unless you soak it in caustic lye, which the cultures did. I don't know how they figured it out. 
Um, their story is that they were told by whoever brought corn to them in the first place, you know, whoever this, you know, the corn mother was, says, oh yeah, by the way, what you've got to do with this stuff is you've got to soak it in lye first. You make the lye by pouring water through your wood ashes, then soak your corn in it, and it's good for you. And it worked. So that's, that's cool. Well, then this one right here, um, retinol blindness. So all right, we can now, this, this is one approach. Let's address all these deficiencies in our agricultural production and do this to the soil and that to the plant and this to here and measure it with meters and all this kind of stuff. Or let's just plant this. Let's pl just plant this. Did a nutri nu nutritional analysis of this system here. Here's the chart. What's the biggest deficiency in this? Check it out. Fall that across. Salt. Why do you think human beings have taste buds for salt? Why do we crave salt? Salt is an essential nutrient that's in every cell of our body always. The terrestrial diet is generally deficient in sodium. We need salt. We need it so bad that it can be now used as crack to get us addicted to whatever it is. And we just kind of shovel the stuff down. And now it's the cause of so many excess diseases because we have too much salt in our diet. It's critically deficient in a terrestrial ecosystem diet. The other thing right here, this is where I was talking about the uh, folic acid. You know where you get folic acid in a diet? You can get it from meat, but leaf, uh, green leaves. Green leaves. So in, in our ecosystem that has all of that, can we find green leaves somewhere to eat? And in Massachusetts, New England states, can you find salt somewhere? It's a whole big bunch of salt in a big pond right outside there. Let's go take a, a really extreme example. This is, this is a, I don't know if they can turn that down. I'm going to have to yell louder. This is a piece of rock, southern Maine. This is that plant community type. Are any of you able to go out and grow your farms and gardens on that rock? Yeah, you can, and you can have a lot of inputs. Or you can go grow this with zero inputs. Yes, I'm using this picture to show an example of the fact that this stuff will grow with sheer, total, utter neglect, stun. It will grow in absolute deficient conditions, and it pr produces sufficient nutrients and sufficient calories. This is the ecological model that in this region, if we imitate that with what we do terrestrially, we are now farming this system instead of trying to add inputs to make our corn and our beans and our broccoli grow. And when there are wild pockets, we can still go out and forage. We can still you know, collect stuff from the sea, et cetera. So I'm just saying this is our ecological model. Where's, where's, where was the soil on this? I mean, how thick? There is no soil. It's, making, it's in the process of making the soil. Um, everything from bunch berries, grass. Who do we know eats grass? Bunny rabbits and guinea pigs. We can have little bunny rabbit and guinea pig ranches all over the place. They can fit in a, in a suburban backyard. Um, uh, currants and gooseberries. Uh, mountain ash, I didn't mention those. They're, they're in there as well. Sorbus, the sorbus uh, plant community, they're distantly related to apples and pears and cherries, make big berries. Uh, there's ferns. Anybody ever at fiddleheads? If there's, ah, some manas admit it. Yeah. Um, We've got cherries growing in here. We've got uh, some raspberries down low, more fiddleheads. There's uh, Labrador tea. It's a great little tea. There's bay, uh, bay berries. You ever heard of bay berries? The berries, you get the wax off the berry, and the leaf is a what? It's a bay leaf. Wow. <laughs> what a concept. We've got our herbs and our spices as well. <coughs> and through this, not this picture, but I think it's this picture here. Yeah. If you've got good eyes in here, there's blueberries, huckleberries. And then there's something else in there. That, there were six of them that I found, but you don't see them until they pop. It's like, where's Waldo? Is, uh, there's one right there. Boom. There's two down here. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Cranberries. So it's, it's, it's a tangled, jumbled up mess, and most people don't recognize what it is. That right there is 100%. And then crowberries, these make little blackberries. This is 100% edible. This is a growing on a rock food forest Massachusetts thing. You know, a little bit wider uh, shot of the same area. Pitcher plants, so it's obviously wet. It's not very well drained. Extremely acidic. We don't have to go add our bile cal or you know this and that. The other thing to amend the soil. Let's grow what grows there and plant it systematically. Harvest it systematically. 
rose hips, you know, vitamin C. There's some more cranberries and you see the foliage, raspberries, grass, uh, even alder, speckled alder, nitrogen fixing uh, woody plant that you, it coppices quite regularly. You can cut it off and it sprouts back from the roots. Once it gets to two inches in diameter of a stem, you can cut it off, inoculate, inoculate it with various different edible mushrooms. So this is producing a, you know, an excess of carbon. It's taking carbon out of the atmosphere and, and making it useful. Here's our cranberries, our grasses. <laughs> and then of course we're producing so much biomass we need to decay it. So let's decay it with our fungus of choice. So we have a full, complete ecosystem that we've designed, uh, and we're producing more nutrients per acre, square foot, et cetera. And because we design it really well, we focus on it. We're a little bit more intensive about it, and we can produce the yields per acre, the, the total caloric and protein yields that we need in order to survive. Or you can do this. Just cut it down. Cut it down. If we're farmers, we're in the business of growing green. We're capturing sunlight and atmosphere and water, and uh, most, most of a plant is made out of um, lignin and cellulose. Lignin and cellulose uh, are made up of three ingredients, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. 99% of a plant is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Where does a plant get carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? It gets it from the air. Photosynthesis is, is what's driving it. It's taking it right from the air. So wait a minute, what's all this thing about soil and stuff like that? You mean plants are mostly air? We're actually farming the air? We're taking the air out of the air and not necessarily the minerals out of the soil? This is where it, it almost seems like a heresy, but you kind of got to listen to like the hydroponics people. It's like, oh, the soil is just a medium by which we supply nutrients to this plant. It just holds it up. It's like, that's twisted because I don't like their version of the world. But if you've got these plants growing on a rock, there is no soil where they're getting everything from. They're getting it from the air and from the, from the rain that comes in from the outside. Or we can go through all the expense, all the work uh, of doing it that way, or we can do it this way. This is an actual factual place. Huh. <laughs> Just thought I made it all up with paintbrushes. This is in the New England states. This is on one of the properties that, that, that I own. Uh, it was a clear cut in 1989. And then I went and I redesigned it and I replanted it to be a food producing natural ecosystem. Uh, it was when I was first trying to tinker with these ideas is that we can imitate a natural ecosystem. Let's plant these plant community types and turn them loose. Well, it just so happens to be that I don't reside there, so it gets almost zero care. I show up maybe once a year. Sometimes it's been three or four years since I've gone back there. And then my, my primary tool is a chainsaw and I'll go ahead and I'll remove plants to either sell as firewood or for, to inoculate into mushrooms. That photograph right there, does that look familiar? Kind of looks like the Northeast, right? 100% of that, 100% of that is food. That is a food forest that you don't have to do almost anything to. My cost of production is almost zero. The real cost of production is harvest cost. Once it's established, harvest cost is like all of it. That is not this. What this is, from my perspective, this is just purely an opinion, this is the outworking of people who have a concept. This right here is someone interacting with reality. I'm not saying that that's not real, but this is a concept that they're trying to impose on the planet and they've got mulch, they've got barriers, they've got all kinds of work that goes into this insanity to keep this food forest going, and it really doesn't produce a whole lot of food. You can go here and live. It provides enough fuel to keep you warm in the wintertime, enough materials to build a home, and enough food to stay alive right there. Yes? This right, well, see, now that, that's why I was saying, this is 30-plus this is years old. This is when I was first tinkering with these ideas. So now it's like, okay, we can plant these plant community types and they grow. Now we need to order them. And that, that's where the design comes in. So the very first picture I showed of, of the farm in Wisconsin, that's now an organized, ordered farm. It's all that plant community type, but planted in rows, planted in strata for high to low, with alleys in between for the grass to make it easy to graze, with water managed to have water all over the place. So once we know that this ecological model works, now it's up to us designers to figure out how to lay it out to make it work on the ground. And that's, that's up to our creativity to figure that out. Yes? 
I do too. Yeah. Yeah, because then what you do, see that little pocket right there? Put them in right there. Where do I get the mulch from? Oh, right over here, instead of having to haul it in from here or over there. And so, so, but that's also what I wanted to get to is now labor. Yes, you enjoy it. Um, who has like a market vegetable garden thing? I've actually grown uh, organic produce commercially for 25 years, um, doing like pallet quantities of stuff, you know, per shipment, kind of whatever. It's hard work. It's a lot of work. And I would rather not do this anymore. And so what I've done on, on the farm in Wisconsin, it's taken 25 years. Last year was the first year that 100% of the yields were perennial, you know, no annuals whatsoever. And the, I tell you, the workload is so much better. So if it takes 25 years, if you start this when you're, I mean, you don't look a day over 80. So if you start now, by the time you're 100, you don't have to be a bend over slave anymore. You're now harvesting more of the perennials. So there's that successional time that goes on. It's a lot more labor intensive. We'll put this guy with the hair to work for us in the early years. And then the later years, you know, we just kick back and harvest what comes out of it. But the nutri nutrients per uh, whatever food quantity, we still, so back to the pockets. We can still do this in the system. We design the system that way. I've got some pictures later on of, of how I did it in the Wisconsin project. You had a, a lady with the glasses question? Because we're programmed, we're programmed to see that as food. Yeah. And so this, this is perfect. This is called, this is called sec food security. Because when the zombies start marching two by two, they don't recognize that as, as a food forest. They only recognize 16 brick rocket stoves in a mud oven. Or they go looking for your onion patch, and they say, oh, who's this loser only growing onions? I'm sick and tired. Oh, we can have garlic. Yippee. And they walk right by this. And I'm hanging out going, dee, 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 you know. Does. Um, so we still do this. Go back to our pockets. Or, or when we now make a systematically ordered system, we do a uh, agroforestry system. I'll get to them in a couple of slides. We can do it on a place like this. We can go to you know, the Cape Cod where there basically isn't any soil. It's all just sand and gravel. We can go to a rock. This is, this is uh, down near Harwich. Uh, these are all really nasty places. Plants, I just learned a new word a couple days ago, and I really like it, veloisioid roots. Plants actually have what are called veloisioid roots. They don't just go into the spaces and cracks in soil. Uh, some actually secrete the acids that directly dissolve the rock. And then once it's a little dissolved puddle, it puts another cell out there and it does it again. And they just dissolve their way through the rock. And they take all those minerals, turn it into a, a organic plant form that then can decay. That's part of how they make soil. Where did this guy get its nutrients? The pine nuts here are 100% you know, nutritious, whatever. It's full spectrum across the board. It's not like your carrots here or spinach that's you know, radically deficient and stuff. Because it's growing. it's growing where it belongs. It's happy there. This is, once again, this is um, purgatory chasm. Where is this getting its nutrients? How on earth does it thrive in that system? And if you don't think the pine nuts have a market, um, think again. Huge market. Sir, they, they've only been discovered in a few plants. It's only a recent discovery of these veloisioid roots. It was thought about and theorized, and somebody actually went and found out that they do that. So how wi widespread is it in plants? We don't know. But, but here's the thing. I'm stupid, OK? I don't need to know that stuff. What matters to me is I look around and say, well, what works? Oh, what works? What works is, you know, <laughs> that right there. That works. Well, why try to plant corn or onions or radishes when what works is more nutrition in that, and it can tolerate the disturbances. So now a windstorm comes by and it knocks your trees over. Well, guess what you have? You have exposed soil. This is where the annual plants come in. Now we plant our, our vegetables and whatever it is, because that is going to be our, our super dense vitamins and minerals and a little bit of roughage, roughage to keep us regular. Our, our bulk carbohydrates, proteins, and oils come from the polyculture, the multidimensional polyculture. What happens if a fire goes through? This is kind of, we hear about it in Paradise, California. It's a little bit weird, but look at the population density on Cape Cod. Cape Cod is a fire environment. All of those plants are designed to burn. One little bad fire on a dry summer there, that's a lot of property damage and a lot of people's stuff going down the tubes. But what happens to the plant community type if we plant it there? It's fine. It's happy. Do some aerial photo Googles of Paradise, California after the fires, and you see green trees. They're happy. You know, some of them got burnt, sure, but they're fine. 
Um, and this is what, this is what uh, the, the drier, stonier plant community types in uh, the Northeast are adapted to. Uh, animal pressure. What if the neighbor's cows get out and come through and graze your system right down to the ground? Well, they sprout back. They're designed to sprout back. If you have a grafted apple tree and it grazes it down to the root, it comes back as the rootstock, not your variety. So another reason that I like to plant seedling, selected seedlings of species, because if you graze it down to the root, when it sprouts back, it's the same plant. And it gets the same yields. I know what to expect out of it. What was the dominant grazing animal right here in... Um, Southern Massachusetts before people got here. Bing, it was mastodons. Elephants belong here, and they push trees over, and then they eat the tops off of it. You push the trees over, you know, you burn them, they come back. And they come back with a full, complete, nutritious human diet, deficient in salt, which we can get from the pond, and deficient, deficient in the folate, which we can get from just eating the leaves. So it's a full, complete nutrition from a perennial ecosystem. Is it going to be a wild, unmanaged ecosystem? No, it's not. This is Western Massachusetts. Oh, but we're not, you know, I'm from Western Massachusetts. I'm from New York. Well, okay, great. It's just a slight different variation. Yes. Here's an interesting thing, the invasives. I, I don't use that term. They are other species than the ones that I put there, okay? And they behave a certain way. And when I manage my property so that this is like the forest and this is the farm, um, when you have a garden or a farm plot, if something happens to it that's real, so when reality happens, you all of a sudden say, oh, no, I've got a problem. I've got invasives or I've got pests or I've got disease. I have to do something to it. And then you ignore what's going on in the forest because that's a long-term management plan. Then you go over to the forest, and it's got like oodles of that stuff in it because you weren't managing the whole system. When you manage the whole system, you see what's going on in these various different places. You come into a relationship and an understanding of how this plant works, what makes it grow faster, what makes it act in such a way that people like you call it invasive, when for me it's not because I'm interacting with this whole. I got multiflora rose buckthorn, honeysuckle, um, bittersweet, uh, all the invasives that you possibly could have in southwest Wisconsin are there. Um, and they're not a problem. Thank you. So, you know, western Massachusetts, New York State, this is a whole same family plant community types, and you've got extra species that are in there. That becomes our firewood, and that becomes our, our source for our mushroom spawn. These are, you know, these are just wild examples. Let's design it and make it look like a farm. How do we design it? Let's order things. Let's have our annual crops. This is my place in Wisconsin. We can cash flow off of our current operation while we have our polycultures. And this is, this is from the top. Remember the oak family? I'm, I'm sticking with the chestnut because it has bears regularly. Chestnut, apples, cherries, hazelnuts, uh, raspberries, and currants, all in that same row. Ben <laughs> I like his time better. <laughs> Grain crops. Hey, you know what? Even though I limit the amount of it, and even though this particular crop is indigestible as, uh, as the seed for a human organism, if we sprout it, it's no longer a seed. It's now a vegetable, and then you add water to it, and you pour off that water and let it ferment, and it's called beer. So I like to eat vegetables. And... <laughs> So we can still do our annual crops. We can still have our corn and our beans and our whatever. I still have bread. Oh, my gosh, a big sourdough, steamy, just with the butter on it. And we have our crops on the side. Our foresters use a term called the land equivalent ratio. If I grow one acre of wheat, for example, and I get a full yield, that's one. If I grow an acre of chestnuts and I get a full yield, that's one. If I do a system now that's 80% wheat, I'm only going to get 80% of a yield. And if I take 20% of the land and put it to chestnuts, they're extra wide spaces, so I'm going to get only a, a lower yield. I'll get 50% of a yield of chestnuts. 80% yield plus a 50% yield is 1.3. That's 130%. There's a picture in my book, Restoration Agriculture, with my youngest son. He's in a, an acre. He's in his exact same spot. And at the time, it was an acre of green bell peppers to be sold wholesale on a truck uh, an acre of acorn squash, an acre of sunflowers, and an acre of chestnuts. And out of those four crops growing in the same place, I got a half a yield of chestnut, half a yield of acorn, half, half a yield of peppers, and a half a yield of sunflowers for two total yields. So that's the compounding effect of this multi-story, multi-species thing 
what we need to figure out as individuals and as, as farmers, farm communities, how do we deal with the fact that we've got this massive diversity of stuff? How much diversity can we handle? I can only handle five. I'd mentioned that earlier. I can only handle five at a time. Due to University of Missouri, Columbia, um, does most of the research, has done most of the research on agroforest in the USA. Virginia Tech has done a lot. Uh, the, in, in, in Atlanta, uh, not Atlanta, but North Athens, Georgia, they've done a lot in agroforestry. And that has a lot to do with it. You keep the soil temperature down. You stay within that photosynthetic range. Um, there's, there's green beans, hazelnuts, uh, uh, hazelnuts uh, chestnuts in the same row, apples with grapes trellised on the apples, currants underneath, and commercial green beans with a vehicle access on either side in between. This is a transitional strategy. Now the heat, grass in the open, will not photosynthesize during the middle of the day. Now you give it some shade, it, it'll photosynthesize all day long. It's more tender, there's less lignin, it's more digestible, higher digestible protein, and then the cattle are happy because they're in the shade. And this is 100% this is edible. I've got walnuts and, and mulberries and grass and cows. It's a perennial system, it works. Almost, almost zero input. You know, there's, our, there's your happy cows. And you just have different species in Florida. I showed you those pines because the whole southern pine, the, the pine savannas, are one of the most critically endangered habitat types in North America. And it's a, it's a shoe-in for, for Florida, Louisiana, Georgia, all that whole band through there. Um, it would look a lot more like this, because these are pines. This is in, uh, that's actually in Kentucky. These are my favorite grazers in the system. And uh, there was a, it's right over there, that uh, 10 by 10 University of Illinois Urbana researchers came in and did a research, and, and I used it as the example in the book. I used it for example here. They found on that particular 10 by 10 plot, uh, th I think it was 30% more total calories per acre than uh, human calories per acre than corn. And then the nutrition is not even a comparison. It's off the charts. Everything from hazelnut, elderberries, chestnuts, currants, raspberries, and these pigs, um, they start grazing in the springtime. They eat their first perennial crop besides grass. They start eating, um, they start eating currants and raspberries, and they go to you know, like mulberries. When the mulberry's on, their noses are purple, their butts are purple, and then cherries and um, hazelnuts and acorns and hickory nuts, and then they finish on chestnuts. And what's interesting is um, I give them snacks in the morning when they're a 30 pound pig. I buy organic feed um, that's, you know, no corn, you know, soy, whatever feed for the pigs. And they only get a ration that'll keep a 30 pound pig alive. And I whistle to them. So they're accustomed to coming whistling. Uh, they, they run up on the trailer and they get their snacks. And that's kind of like their vitamin, their one a day vitamin. And then if they want to gain weight, they got to go out there and find it and gain weight. And so that's what they do. And they've got such an abundance that the electric fence can go down and they don't break out because this is the best habitat for them. They're not going anywhere. There's no food out there. I'm going to stay home because this is the best place. And then at the uh, end of the season, you just kind of like whistle them in in the morning and shut the gate and away they go. They go somewhere else. Free range chickens. If, how many of you guys went to Ray Hinaldo's talk? What's the canopy that they're raising their chickens under? Hazelnuts. Yeah. So these chickens, once your predation goes way, 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 way down, I'm into this free range thing, and I figure if I can turn them loose and I get some back, that's a win. If I have to baby these things and protect them from foxes and bobcats, we had a bobcat in the chickens you know, just not too long ago, and you look at these gals, those are not your domestic barnyard chickens. They have connected again with something that's their velociraptor past. <laughs> and so what you do is, once again, you give them snacks in the morning, they come running to you, uh, so that's the only reason why they came out of the cover. And they're like, hey, man, where is it? What's this camera stuff? <laughs> Turkeys are actually pretty smart. I've seen a turkey once, a grasshopper took off and goes this way. And the turkey takes off and goes that way. It's like, what are you, afraid of a freaking grasshopper? But it was like an outfielder for the world's best baseball team. And f anyways, and, and they hear the crack of the bat. They look once, and they don't even look. And they just run to where the ball's going, and then they catch it. So this, this turkey takes off and goes that way, and sure enough, the grasshopper goes like this, and the turkey intercepted it like six feet off the ground. It's like, wow, brilliant. But it wasn't raised in a stupid box. We didn't chase him in. Oh, it's raining. Put the turkeys in. It's like, they drown. It's called natural selection. That's, we don't need those in the gene pool. We produce so much carbon, we've got to decay it somehow. Let's decay it with medicinal and edible mushrooms. Water. 
wild rice, domestic rice, let's use our water resource, let's collect, have water collecting channels grow cattails in our wild rice. That's an additional yield in our system. This is zombie proof. This goes back to the when you looked at it and you weren't hungry. The zombies walk right by this. They don't realize that it's 100% food. This is a real food forest, not a concept. <clears throat> this actually produces enough of an income to pay the bills and feed you. I eat, and this, so this, pardon? Pff, I'm not telling. <clears throat> That's, that's uh, chestnut, butternut, cherry, service berry, uh, raspberries, uh, currants, and grass. And the grass is for the cattle and the pigs. I don't like sheep. Uh, I, you've used them every once in a while. I like the Marine Corps. They're small, they're ugly, and they stink. And you go out and you make a mess of things with them, which is what I use them for, and then you shoot them. It's... <laughs> sorry, sorry, brothers. <laughs> um, so there, there's, who is the, you don't get hungry lady with the glasses back there. And then, and then the harvesting. This is more orderly. It's, in a, it's an orderly row, as you know that. Oh, good. What I like, the, and here's, here's cattle. You can't graze cattle in your apple orchard. Well, they don't first. I go pick all this stuff first. And when it comes to harvesting uh, fruit, apples off of trees, I do what's called, I harvest what's called the low-hanging fruit. Huh. Wow, I just pick this stuff, and then the rest of it falls off, and that's for the pigs. The cattle go through there. They prune off all the branches down below. They've now short-circuited the scab cycle, which is splashed up from the ground. It's a fungal disease. It splashes on a leaf, and then it splashes and infects the whole tree and, and can defoliate your tree. They remove the branches down the, the low. I don't have to do it, so they're doing my disease control. Well, then you don't want all those non-sprayed, pest and disease-riddled fruits. And when I'm picking the low-hanging fruit, if it's got a bug in it, I throw it on the ground. Oh, no, it'll get into the ground and pupate. You'll have more pests. It's like, no, I won't, because as soon as I'm done, the pigs are going to clean up every one of those and lay down and ferment and go, wee. <laughs> so they're doing the pest control for me, the disease control for me. It's an input. These are hazelnuts. These are the um, uh, North American hybrids that I've been working on, Forest Agriculture Enterprises. Where's Karen? I know some folks in here. Hey there, I just finally recognize you. <laughs> are growing these. They're a bush type. One of the things I like best about this is when we reestablish natural plant community types, three-dimensional perennial ecosystems that produce our food, fuels, medicines, and fiber, other people have places to live too. By other people, I mean like these guys. Who knows what that is? That's a um, uh, polyphemus moth. Look at the size of that thing. It's, it's not on the endangered species list, but it's very rare. You got a question, comment? It's different based on which primary tree crops you're using. It depends on your slope, your soil type, and the region of the country that you're in. It's a little bit custom designed. Although nature repeats the same cookie cutter everywhere, it's custom designed based on the conditions of your site. So her place is different than his place, different than my place, different than your place. Yeah. Well, that actually, that actually leads to another point, because what's interesting about that, now think of all the nutrient availability in a system like this when it's adapted to that site. When the animals are eating that, instead of getting you know, stuff that's devoid of nutrition, they're getting hypernutritious stuff, so then the animal products have more nutrition in it. So if those fruit are more nutritious than just the fruit that I can reach, um, I'll sell the fruit that I can reach as, as cash, and then I'll let the pigs eat the more nutritious stuff, and I'll eat the pigs. So who knows what this is? This is a Cecropia moth, largest moth in North America, the size of a dinner plate. These are all rare species that all of a sudden just showed up. And I'm, you think about this, middle corn, right? And then for 25 years, you start doing this. This is an oasis. This is a refugia from the zombie apocalypse disaster that's happening to us on planet Earth. And all these species are coming running home. This is where they belong. And I get to eat. I get to eat chestnuts and mushrooms and morels and asparagus and oh, pork. Oh, my gosh, I'm hungry. My green leaves, my vegetables. I'm growing vegetables. We can grow our vegetables in the system. We got this wildlife that kind of hangs out. This is a, a, a northern cricket frog that shows up at the time from when it goes into a little vernal pool that I've created with my water collection systems all over the place, uh, n nine days from when it lays an egg to hops out as an adult. One of the rarest mushrooms on the face of the planet showed up on its own. And then this thing, just like three weeks ago, shows up. It's, notice how fat that head is. This is a one-button Massasagua rattlesnake. Or you can do this. Add everything you want. Make this as hyper-nutritious as you possibly can. Do it. 
go for it. I love it. It's awesome. You will get better results out of an ecosystem and do this in the alleys in between. We can take a cornfield, we can take a clear cut, we can turn it into this and 100% of it is three-dimensional food from top to bottom, carbon sequestration, building the soil, infiltrating the water, purifying the water, creating habitat for all of our brothers and sisters, two-legged, four-legged, winged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it won't look like what you have been told that a farm is. And we have to do things for real in reality, not based on concepts that are not necessarily accurate. Because the eyes of the future are looking back at us, and they are praying that we see beyond our own time and get up and do something about it. So please go home. Do something about this. Uh, contact us if you need any kind of help, restoration, agriculture, development. There's a couple guys in the back room, Jared and Kevin. Um, and where's Karen? She took off. Yes, ma'am. Um, specific machinery to harvest the system. Uh, have, we, have I had to develop specific machinery to harvest that system? I haven't because what's really cool is there's what they call engineering schools all over the place, and kids are looking for something to do to give their life meaning. And so, okay, kid, invent a machine that harvests hazelnuts off a bush. So there's a lot of work being done. If you go Google... Um, Almond, mechanical harvest almonds, that harvester right there actually is in Wisconsin right now, and it has been adapted to harvest bush hazelnuts. It'll harvest raspberries. It'll harvest grapes. It'll harvest currants. So it's a multi-use harvesting tool. So this can be done at scale. It can be scaled up like that. I actually have invented a couple machines, but I haven't had to. But I, I did because I thought I had to at the time. I, that was before I realized, like, hey, wow, there's engineering schools with kids who want to do this. I'll let them do it. And they get credit for it. So it's not commercially available. You have to go out. Well, it's not true. It, it's commercially available. I just told you go Google and look at this thing. <laughs> the company that makes it is Oxbow, O-X-B-O. And then if you want to harvest chestnuts, you want to harvest walnuts, you want to harvest acorns, all that equipment's off the shelf. You want to process all those? The processing equipment already exists all around the world. The issue, and here, this is why Kevin and, and Jared are here, the issue with these crops are that is you guys, we aren't growing enough of it because it doesn't make any sense for you to grow two or three acres of a system like this because now you can't, you don't have enough. You'll feed yourself, but you don't have enough to, to have the harvest equipment, the processing equipment. So what we need to do is we all gang together. We all pitch in a couple of bucks, and then we buy all the equipment that we need. It already exists. Well, if it needs to be tweaked, it gets tweaked a little bit because our company has the engineers that are tweaking it. And then when we need this equipment, I only have five or 10 acres. You only have 20 acres. It comes by, zip, 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 zip. You're part of this company that we created. You guys familiar with Organic Valley? I was grower number 24 at Organic Valley. When I joined, it had $300,000 worth of sales. And we dreamed of the day, someday we'll be a big business and we'll have a million dollars in sales. It was in 2015 that we crossed over a billion. Instead of being grower number 20, it's a farmer owned. As a farmer, I get paid shit for my crops. You're a farmer, get over it. We're going to get paid shit for our crops. But as a member of this company, I own a piece of that company and my stock keeps going up. As a member of this company, I now have a pool of others that I can collaborate with instead of trying to find a source and, oh, can I afford a 50 pound bag of buckwheat seed? No, no, no. We all get together and we buy a 3,000 pound heavy bag tote of buckwheat seed for a lower price. Well, then you get the machinery that cleans it all up, and so now you have enough of a volume to sell to all of us that you have a small business cleaning seed for us, and we get it below retail prices. All of the renewable energy stuff we buy as a gang. Converted my tractor and my truck to run on straight vegetable oil, my little Volkswagen Jetta to run on straight vegetable oil. Couldn't do that alone. All of us can still be little guys, but when we get together and we work collaboratively, we act as a big guy doesn't solve any of the problems of a business having to interact in the business world. And it doesn't solve the problem of the fact that I can't stand you. And you vote against me all the time, but we at least have a say in it. We don't have to like each other to work with one another. But we have to work with one another. We have to hang together, because if we don't hang together, we will hang separately. The, the, dairy, the dairy farm side of it, what we're doing in this room here, the collaborative group that we've got going on here, we don't deal with the specifics of the dairy. That's your business. So we'll know it's okay. That's your business. Right. We're setting up the perennial systems. It can still be organic valley. The, that's you and Organic Valley talking. That's not me. Oh, you're not 
I am a owner and a member of Organic Valley. I've been shipping products through Organic Valley. I'm not the guy who makes decisions. I'm one of the guys that makes decisions with these guys over here uh, on the agroforestry systems. And that is the model is that the farmer, farmer on the ground also owns a piece of the aggregation company, the processing company, value-added distribution company. It's a similar model to Organic Valley, but it's not the, on the co-op model, and it's not exclusively dairy, vegetables, or eggs. I'm five minutes past. Get out of here. You can hang around for questions. I'll answer questions all day.